Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Security Theater, the podcast by the Center for International Security at the Faculty of Political Science of the University of Belgrade. We bring you scholarly interviews, discussions, and lectures on the theory and practice of international relations and international security. This series is part of the Regional Security Knowledge Hub project that is supported by the OSC mission in Serbia. Our guest today is uh, Dr. Jelena Radoman, a security studies scholar whose book entitled Military Neutrality of Small States in the 21st Century uh, was published uh, recently by Palgrave Macmillan. Jelena holds a PhD from University of Belgrade Faculty of Political Science and uh, was a visiting PhD fellow at the Swedish Defense University. Her working portfolio has been built in leading think tanks in Serbia, uh, state institutions, and international organizations. She also holds an MA in Peace, Security, and Integrations from the University College London, and a BA in International Security at uh, this particular institution, uh, the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Belgrade. Jelena, welcome and congratulations on the book, uh, which has been published recently by Palgrave Macmillan. And uh, our today's particular cause is to discuss uh, specific uh, theoretical, empirical, and uh, comparative aspects of the work that you published, and uh, also to some extent to uh, tackle the issue of uh, challenges in bringing successful publication of a doctoral dissertation. So uh, we see that uh, you have uh, managed to successfully turn your dissertation into a book, uh, which is a, a very, very commendable effort. Uh, so uh, I have uh, read the book and uh, found it uh, very interesting because uh, I'm also uh, doing uh, small states research. And uh, I think that the book is uh, thoroughly researched and that it combines uh, in-depth case studies, comparative, comparative aspects and application of the theoretical model that you proposed uh, in a highly systematized and well-organized manner. So uh, we know from the literature that there is no consensus on the definition of small states. So how would you define a small state and what would you say are the key arguments for studying these uh, Lilliputians of world politics? We know that people usually concentrate more on world stage, on great powers, but small states are often neglected. Where then you position your arg argument in this literature? Uh, thank you, Marta. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. And it's great to have uh, this chat with, uh, with a colleague who does um, uh, work in a similar area as I do. So yes, you are right. I had to do my portion of research um, on small states uh, literature, although it was not, m not my primary motive when uh, doing my uh, PhD project. I was particularly drawn by two specific cases of small states. Sweden, located in geographically uh, distinct region compared to Serbia, uh, situated in a completely different set of political, economic, uh, and historical uh, circumstances, but yet that somehow came to define their security policies uh, in almost identical terms. Uh, what I found uh, at the very beginning of my research that uh, if I want to explain what military neutrality is today for the two particular case studies of small states, I would need to dig deeper in what scholars uh, say about small states in general, so what they assume or not assume about them. Um, uh, throughout the book, it's obvious that I am somehow closer to the definitions of small states who like to present them in relation to medium or big powers and that I'm closer to the definitions that do not like to look at small states as those items that are somehow locked into some kind of hierarchy of powers and that they are not able to maneuver uh, uh, beyond their geographical positions, beyond uh, material capacities in terms of military, economic and political power usually defined in, in purely um, 
material sense. So I'm much closer to look at small states as those who are able to bypass uh, the limitations of their material capacities, thus that are able to uh, punch beyond their material weight, mm -hmm. but are, are still somehow falling short to secure their national security goals on their own which is kind of a contradiction because we are uh, speaking about highly interconnected world of the day, so it would be um, um, somehow wrong to assume that there are states that are uh, capable of defining and then securing their national political goals on their own, not thinking about the global security uh, agenda. But in my understanding, small states are those that are more vulnerable to the complexities of that interconnected security agenda of the day are less capable of uh, uh, achieving their national security goals on their own and are more dependent on a uh, uh, global security setup. Uh, so I don't know if that satisfies uh, the introductory question, but that's how I set the, uh, the agenda for my own um, research. Uh, why study them? Uh, well, it's an interesting question, but the majority of states today actually uh, define themselves rather as a small or medium power, uh, powers uh, rather than big powers. And for me, it was interesting to look at the self-perception of states, how they choose to position themselves in the, that global ranking of uh, big or medium or uh, small powers. So. Uh, Sweden is an interesting case mm -hmm. uh, in that respect. For an outsider, we might think that uh, Sweden might be defined as a middle power, but not in the view of Swedish scholars, in uh, views of Swedish uh, uh, national leaders, or those mm -hmm. with the ability to define the national security goals. Sweden is a is a small state, so I was looking uh, state, so I was looking at uh, how uh, national leadership actually defines um, their role and how they define abilities uh, of, of a particular state that they are leading. In that respect, um, yeah, I look at uh, how they uh, self-perceive mm -hmm. uh, their power ranking. That brings me to where do I position my own research. Um, for those that would actually read the, the book, uh, they will see that I somehow played in between various uh, theoretical uh, premises. I could not abandon completely realism and neorealism and their assumptions, although I strongly argue throughout my research that uh, they are not capable to explain why particular small uh, states choose to, to stay outside of military alliances today in the 24th centuries. Uh, 24th century, uh, still I could not completely disregard uh, dis uh, some of the benefits that that conceptual framework brought to the research of military neutrality and non-alignment. So I'm still counting on threat perceptions. Mm -hmm. I'm still counting on how political uh, and military leadership uh, see uh, the uh, military power in relation to the uh, geographical and other uh, settings. So they are most of the time, they're still thinking and defining their national secu their security slash military um, goals uh, in those terms. Mm -hmm. Yet, I'm personally closer to the conceptual framework, uh, framework of uh, constructivism. I'm still uh, speaking about perception and identities, and especially in the case of uh, Sweden, uh, how being military neutral or non-aligned for centuries is, uh, is actually built into the uh, national identity and what Sweden is today and that plays less uh, in the case of Serbia. Thank you very much for this uh, introductory elaboration uh, that actually positions your research in a wider uh, setting of IR, uh, small state studies as well as uh, this uh, uh, what is very interesting uh, combination between realism and constructivism 
because that is basically a challenge today, how to make a comprehensive theorizing without making certain theoretical camps, because people usually opt for some theoretical uh, program, for example, uh, whether it is a, a neoclassical realism or someone who is trying to do some exercise in constructivist foreign policy research, but uh, usually those uh, types of research uh, agendas uh, are having certain deficiencies, so we are trying to seek for some middle way uh, in that kind of research. And uh, in my own research, uh, I was uh, actually uh, opting for this constructivist framework at first, but towards the end of my research, I realized that I needed also some kind of uh, realist uh, argumentation to be supplemented to this. And uh, uh, that is probably the best way to look at small states without actually opting for some very specific niche within the research agenda, for example, whether is it, is it a state identity or some kind of uh, discourse analysis, for example. So I actually liked the way uh, you uh, provided this uh, deep historical analysis. You, you provided uh, an in-depth case study analysis uh, uh, that actually was very well grounded in uh, historical literature, in, in primary sources and, and others. So, uh, but when it comes to this uh, understanding of uh, uh, small state uh, foreign policy and security policy options, uh, it is probably not a common point today to observe uh, the best option to be a neutral state. So, in your view, why small states actually choose to be neutral or to remain neutral, and uh, uh, you actually developed this model that is based on the variables such as experience of war, threat perception, and domestic policies. So why small states uh, opt for being neutral? What is the explanation in a theoretical sense, and what you found empirically? Yeah. Well, historically, it was a war avoidance technique. We cannot neglect the fact that, uh, speaking of military neutrality, we are speaking of neutrality um, in war times. So small states were basically trying to hide away from conflicts where they would be dread uh, and where they found themselves not gaining uh, much. That is not their uh, uh, war to, to handle. And we're actually being uh, exposed to a uh, significant amount of risks. Most of the time, uh, uh, historically speaking, uh, small states did not have uh, that luxury of actually remaining military neutral, being dependent or actually seeking protection of bigger powers and seeking alliance membership. Uh, actually, they were meant to be involved in the conflict uh, even when they were trying to hide away. Uh, uh, the Second World War is the best example of how mm -hmm. unsuccessful that technique was and the majority of states that actually uh, try to remain neutral of that conflict fail, uh, failed almost uh, immediately from the very beginning and then some others uh, actually managed to maintain neutrality but some of them uh, at the at the expense of a highly uh, controversial conduct of, of neutrality. Uh, that was historically speaking. What I'm trying to do in my own research and why I, I put a very specific uh, definition of the time frame that I'm looking at, that is the present moment, uh, why I'm looking at military neutrality as a security option as of today, uh, I'm not trying to say it's a war avoidance technique anymore because the uh, security agenda and the whole contextual setting is uh, significantly different compared to what those researchers who did historical account of military neutrality actually explored before us. Before us. Today, um, uh, states are uh, have the luxury of being uh, politically uh, active of being perceived as uh, being politically aligned uh, and uh, still having luxury of uh, staying outside of uh, military alliances. So there is um, still a small niche of where they, from different reasons, as I explained in my book, Sweden from historical reasons and Serbia rather from uh, internal political reasons, still uh, say no to the membership uh, to military alliances, 
uh, with the luxury of saying we, this is not a, a passive security strategy, this is not a war avoidance technique, mm -hmm. and we are not saying uh, we are not staying politically neutral to the uh, issues and global security agenda, but from different reasons we are saying no to the membership um, to military alliances and then from yeah. different reasons and from different uh, historical backgrounds Sweden uh, does that from uh, its own historical uh, track record mm -hmm. and Serbia does that on a completely different uh, set of premises. Thank you for uh, putting emphasis on this historical aspect because uh, Truly, uh, small states uh, uh, had uh, their uh, significant episodes of military neutrality. For example, let, let us think about Belgium, which was kind of uh, left on its own uh, during the First and the Second World Wars. And then, uh, for example, some other states which were trying in the interwar period some options of uh, aligning with other small states. So I actually find interesting this uh, study by, by Rod Robert Rothstein on, on small states and alliances where he studies also Serbia as an example of a small state which was uh, in some interpretations instrumental to the uh, emergence of the First World War. On the other hand, it was a victim of the First World War and the great power games. But uh, speaking of, uh, of Serbia, of Yugoslavia and other states uh, which uh, were uh, non-aligned, uh, you uh, draw this uh, difference between neutrality and non-alignment and how actually non-alignment and neutrality are, are defined today because when you say, for example, that small, uh, sorry, not you, but, but when people say that some state is uh, non-aligned, they would think of a state which uh, has some quality of uh, a Yugoslav mm. foreign policy uh, uh, and, for example, in some uh, newly the formal interpretations of uh, neutrality, for example, in the case of Sweden, uh, it would be said that Sweden is right, non-aligned. So can you maybe try to, to kind of uh, bring us some definitions and how you actually delineate between neutrality and non-alignment uh, First of all, to, to make the conceptual confusion uh, a bit smaller, uh, in my understanding, the non-aligned movement in its all greatness and the very the peculiar um, quality it brought, but very specific uh, historical moment of the, uh, of the Cold War uh, was not an example of military neutrality nor example of military non-alignment. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a political movement bring, uh, which strived to present itself as a third wave and as mm -hmm. a political alternative to the Cold War hostilities between the, the great powers. And it was not uh, uh, my ambition to assess the validity or how successful that attempt was, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. But what I do argue is that former Yugoslavia um, did uh, play a significant role uh, in that movement and used the movement to, bring to, uh, to build a political platform of its own. Sweden uh, did something also very peculiar uh, in the same historical uh, setting, uh, setting also involved with that, uh, with that movement, but building its own political portfolio also on the premises of military neutrality and also uh, pointing to uh, uh, how flawed is the call, uh, the call concept of mm -hmm. um, uh, two uh, superpowers uh, being um, confronted on so many levels, political, economic, and military, and how that spilled over, and how that actually uh, harmed the, the broader uh, international setting. Today, uh, neither uh, Sweden nor Serbia define their position as military neutrality, but rather as military non-alignment. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, happened uh, in a significant period of time when, uh, in the case of uh, Sweden, that happened when uh, Swedish political leadership um, uh, discussed the option of the EU membership that significantly had an impact on the uh, self-understanding and definition of what military neutrality means. If we read uh, the conceptual uh, framework and how positioned mil Serbian uh, military neutrality exists, it is also understood and actually defined in the terms of military non-alignment. Mm -hmm. We are not members of the military alliances, which does not uh, prevent the position of 
politically active force. So mm -hmm. military neutrality uh, uh, throughout the historical, uh, broader historical period that I attempted to sketch uh, some uh, uh, the most significant authors and the work that actually did a much better review of broader historical context that I uh, ever had an uh, ambition to do. Uh, military neutrality was a broader concept that also applied uh, some kind of uh, political neutrality. Mm -hmm. Today, military non-alignment is uh, understood in a more technical sense. It is a security strategy that says no to the membership in military alliances, but at the same time leaves enough room for uh, small states to uh, have uh, very active mm -hmm. political roles if they wish so and if they have qualities and ambitions and maneuvering space in, in other terms, not only military capacities, to, to play. Which basically uh, brings me back to one of your initial questions, why to study uh, small mm -hmm. states uh, then at all, while uh, throughout the, the history of international relations literature, somehow the bulk of the efforts was often concentrated on big powers and how uh, their scholars and their leadership came to big ideas that then uh, attempted to define uh, the world setting for better or for worse. Uh, it seems that small states are those that, while trying to be uh, creative, trying to basically survive in a very complex setting, can bring very novel, very fresh, and very vivid ideas. Sometimes they uh, have an ambition, uh, an ambition not uh, merely uh, a survival, but sometimes it's a status mm -hmm. seeking that was mm -hmm. excellently explained and, and pictured in the work of uh, some of our Scandinavian colleagues, for example, no the, case, uh, yes. the case of and Carv the Carvalho. Yeah, yeah, the case of Norway. Uh, what the states would do with that status uh, once received, uh, they left for some further research, but for me it was, it was a very interesting idea. Some actions are simply for the status seeking, mm -hmm. and then we'll see uh, what will come out, uh, out of that. I think it's very important that you draw this uh, difference between political and military aspects in our uh, closer understanding of what neutrality and non-alignment are, because uh, that leads me to this uh, question of when the military neutrality is possible or desirable for a small state, because you mentioned this aspect of uh, survival, uh, when uh, the international environment uh, dictates the option of survival for a small state, then is it uh, better for a small state to remain or become military neutral or to try to to uh, bandwagon or to join some alliance or some of the stronger uh, either neighbors or some powers with the international system because in, in this uh, classical literature on small states one of the comments would be that uh, it's not good for a small state to join but to try to either balance or to become neutral yeah well um while doing this um, uh, uh, review of what historical account of neutrality was, I saw that uh, one of the major efforts was invested in discussing what kind of circumstances are good or bad for uh, states that uh, strive to stay military neutral throughout the history. So authors were pretty much uh, preoccupied. So um, is it better to have a bipolar uh, international setting or multipolar, etc., etc., uh, and all kinds of external and internal um, circumstances that would actually allow small states to be successful in the attempt of military neutral. So one of the uh, some of the most um, relevant internal circumstances where you need to have um, a population that actually supports the idea, you need to basically uh, offer something to hostile great powers that would actually prevent them of overriding your military neutrality. It's either you build your military capacities to the level that would actually harm the potential attackers, so they, they do not try to uh, to 
um, attack you or, and things like that. So uh, authors were uh, playing with a number of case studies, mostly on the examples of the First and the Second World mm -hmm. War, because they were so rich uh, in the examples of the, um, uh, of the states that most of the time failed um, in an attempt to stay neutral of the global conflict. If we are talking about today, uh, I would say that I it is a viable security option, as we can see, especially in the case of Sweden, mm -hmm. which is then drastically different compared uh, to the case of, of Serbia. Uh, for Sweden, it is easy to claim uh, military uh, non-alignment as a uh, security strategy. First of all, the historical track record proved it to be a successful strategy to its own population that is uh, strongly attached to the idea of, uh, uh, of neutral Sweden. Uh, that's reason number one. Reason number two, uh, no one questions where uh, Sweden sits politically or mm -hmm. to which camps it belongs politically. It was not uh, the question uh, throughout the Cold War and it's not a question now. And for Sweden it's very easy to be vocal and to have a clear stand on the majority of global political issues. Unlike uh, in case of Serbia, whose military non-alignment, and that's not uh, only my argument, I've seen that argument shared by a number of our colleagues who are also discussing what, what kind of foreign and security uh, politics Serbia is actually is trying to, to build today. Uh, its military non-alignment is basically built uh, as a kind of, first of all, catch-all internal uh, mm -hmm. political strategy and at the same time as a strategy that tries to somehow uh, bypass strong internal ideological divide where mm -hmm. Serbia belongs ideologically to the East or to the West. Um, from, for both reasons, internal uh, political, because mm -hmm. it basically suits ruling uh, parties to sell both the East and the West option to its voters if they have if they want to have very broad uh, 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 political uh, support among the citizens um, and for deep uh, ideological reasons they have strong historical trajectory behind them Serbia is unable to play very active political role because it's very hard to be vocal and to have a clear stance on a number of, of um, highly uh, contested political developments. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, Russian aggression uh, on Ukraine being mm -hmm. one of them. Uh, and in this sense, you already touched upon uh, this uh, impact of domestic and external factors in shaping military neutrality or non-alignment as a security policy. Uh, so and. Uh, that leads us to the two case studies that you elaborated on it's Serbia and Sweden. So uh, what I would like uh, to ask you now is uh, how would you briefly assess the relative relationship between internal and external policy factors in the shaping of Serbia's and Sweden's uh, security policies? So uh, maybe we can uh, try to elaborate some historical, key historical uh, patterns or uh, maybe also to touch upon briefly on the more contemporary uh, aspects of uh, party politics in, in shaping of the security policies. Um, well, more in case um, of Sweden than in case of Serbia, there are uh, internal political actors that uh, whose political agenda uh, is strongly attached to the concept of neutrality and of that social uh, democratic uh, party in the case of Sweden, whose political portfolio was somehow strongly interlinked with the concept, um, and less in the case of Serbia, whose uh, uh, political parties do not, first of all, are not easily positioned on the uh, left-right political spectrum, as we can assess political parties uh, in some other countries. Uh, and who do not uh, have a very strong stand on foreign politics or alliance politics, which alliance politics which, uh, basically became a question only lately and not throughout the history. Mm -hmm. There are some other uh, issues that are defined, that are more defining. 
for the political parties um, in Serbia. Uh, I did not find that question as a, a huge factor in inter-party politics, neither in Sweden nor in Serbia. NATO membership is not a burning issue uh, during the elections, uh, uh, neither in Sweden nor in Serbia, not are political parties in any of the two cases clashing over the alliance membership or the alliance politics in general. There are some other uh, issues that are uh, basically they are um, uh, they are struggling with, which does not need, which does not imply that they political parties do not have uh, their own views or that there are no clear division who are pro or, or against the possibility of NATO membership, for example, uh, in, uh, in the case of, uh, of Sweden. But I did not uh, find internal political party politics to be uh, defining uh, in any of the two cases. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, rather an interplay between um, historical trajectory, but more how historical trajectory is being interpreted and mm -hmm. retold by those who have power to define the narrative and to uh, frame uh, historical lessons learned. Uh, in the case of Sweden, that's pretty straightforward case because the same successful story of Swedish neutrality has been retold throughout the centuries. So it would be very hard to challenge the, the already mm -hmm. established narrative and to say, well, it's not such a successful project because it is. And then uh, ideologically very strongly interlinked with the self-perception of who Swedes are. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit different in, in the case of Serbia, but uh, we as an observers, we do um, witness nowadays how the historical narratives are being presented and how only particular historical episodes could, could be picked from the whole trajectory of historical learning and then the whole narratives and uh, mythology of Serbia being either a loser or a victor of historical events then could be built based on which episodes you choose and then how you build the whole narrative around it. Um, still, I do not think that uh, the that whole project of narrative remaking or what to make of uh, Serbia's distant and the most recent history is made for the purpose of convincing the citizens for or against NATO membership, that, because that's not yet on the agenda. That's for a, a, a bit broader purpose of um, uh, convincing Serbian citizens we are the victors or we are the losers or we are the one who are being attacked uh, all the time or we are the one who needs to be uh, armed and rear armed, armed and whose military needs to be strong enough to defend ourselves because we are basically in a hostile regional settings and this is not me assessing uh, mm -hmm. the regional and global uh, uh, setting of Serbia, but that's basically how the narrative is being uh, told. So, narrative, that is one of the key words and it, it brings us closer to this constructivist mm -hmm. uh, part of your analysis, uh, which actually uh, draws the next question, uh, which is, if uh, military neutrality is a socially constructed uh, thing, and uh, if uh, it is a socially con it is, if it is a social construct, so for what purposes states use neutrality, and uh, how do they bring their own state identity onto the world stage through that socially constructed fact? You mentioned this uh, act of persuasion, basically that. Uh, uh, it is constantly reenacted uh, uh, by uh, invoking certain narratives, certain parts of history, and uh, it brings probably one of your um, variables, which is uh, this historical experience of war, uh, and uh, how this relates to the projection of the international identity of a small state. 
Well, first of all, uh, for what purposes states can and actually do use a project of military neutrality or non-alignment rather in today's terms? Well, uh, it could be uh, used as a platform to build position of moral superpower, mm -hmm. which Sweden did for decades, and position itself as somehow distant uh, to the political West, although it was constantly perceived to politically belong to the West campus uh, of states, especially during the Cold War, but still as a moral superpower that can actually preach the United States of uh, the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, it could also, um, military neutrality could be used um, as a political platform to still present yourself as something peculiar and bit alternative that I think Serbia is trying to unsuccessfully present itself at least in the uh, in the context uh, of the regional affairs unsuccessfully I say because I don't think that uh, the whole uh, idea and narrative we are military uh, neutral is actually well received and perceived as, as such uh, by um, our neighbors unfortunately, uh, because uh, I don't see that neighbors uh, are actually uh, believe that, uh, that actually Serbia has um, a luxury to stay uh, neutral in terms of regional affairs mm -hmm. or that is actually sincere in staying uh, neutral, at least politically neutral in majority of regional affairs. So it could be a platform for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. It could also be a platform for having very active, at the same time, very incoherent military and political relations with a number of very different stakeholders, as we can see uh, in the case of Serbia today. So having Basically, is it more complex now? Because we have uh, this uh, uh, multipolarizing world, uh, basically, where you have different actors, in, especially in this region, who are external actors. Now we also have Chinese influence, Russian influence, the influence of the European Union, and also some other small states, such as, for example, Qatar or uh, Bahrain or others who are trying to have their economic influence in the region. So, does it complicate actually uh, neutrality? option for a small state or does it um, make actually it more appealable? Appealing. Uh, de depending for whom. Uh, it, uh, it does complicate things for uh, uh, external observers, I would say, who would like to have more uh, coherent view of uh, what is Serbia doing, how Serbia mm -hmm. positions itself in foreign policy terms. Uh, for uh, current Serbia uh, political leadership, I think it makes it very appealing because it allows it, uh, it gives them political platform to say, but we are military neutral and basically we can afford to have um, simultaneous mm -hmm. political cooperation with a variety of stakeholders uh, who do not always ag agree on number of issues mm -hmm. in global or regional terms. So targeting both uh, audiences, international and domestic. Yeah. So yeah. You, you invoke Putnam's two-level game, yeah. actually, in the analysis. Yeah. So this is a very well-grounded uh, yeah. research in that yeah. sense. Telling scenario, yeah. yes. Uh, so this brings us uh, almost to, to the end of uh, our, our discussion today. Uh, and uh, here I would like to, to ask you about uh, how do you uh, see the possibility for uh, security policy change for a neutral or non-aligned state. For example, how would you assess the possibilities for change of uh, neutrality in Sweden and in Serbia? And uh, what would need to happen in order for a state to change, to shift towards uh, military alliance? Well, uh, God forbid, uh, global uh, conflict of uh, uh, alongside very well defined uh, uh, political and military uh, lines that would actually push the states to one or another or, uh, camp, whatever the camps of, or alliances of any future possible war would be. Uh, but at the moment, I see it as a plausible strategy as it's being mm -hmm. used 
on different grounds and for different reasons uh, in the case of, of different, different states. Um, as long as uh, there, re there are multiple fora that allow political and military cooperation uh, other than pure military alliances. So we're, let us not speak only of NATO. There are security cooperation uh, platforms such as uh, OSC, such as Council of Europe. The EU uh, could be seen as a, a security alliance of one kind and we can discuss if a uh, concept of uh, alliance membership is made be applicable to the membership uh, into the European Union. Maybe we can even mm -hmm. discuss if uh, that's uh, one of uh, possible, uh, if, if it's conceptually possible to apply that concept to the membership uh, in the European Union. So as long as uh, military and non-aligned states have e enough for us to be engaged with and not to stay isolated because it's not an isolationistic uh, politics of the day, uh, then I think it's, a, it's viable and it will actually survive. Uh, these are very interesting times uh, because uh, uh, usually uh, when we have uh, uh, some international crisis, states usually probably try to become neutral. Or when you have some uh, tipping points, for example, I don't know, for, uh, I don't know, maybe Serbia or s for some other country, maybe they could uh, think about uh, keeping their uh, political alignment and military neutrality. We see that there are precedents for such policies, at least uh, in the cases uh, that you mentioned, uh, such as Sweden or countries such as Ireland, Austria, for its historical reasons. But definitely it, uh, it uh, keeps the option, in my view, of new neutrality uh, an appealing one. But still, in the, uh, in the sense of small states literature, uh, uh, it uh, is a curious position because those small states which are military neutral, they haven't resolved completely the integration autonomy dilemma, such as... Uh, the one uh, posited by some scholars about 20 years ago, for example, uh, for most of the Western Balkan small states, their option was full integration and autonomy is then uh, discarded a bit, but then they try to keep this position of uh, uh, seeking influence within the European Union framework and then keeping those influential strategies. And then we have Serbia, which is a military neutral small state and then it has its defensive security and foreign policy. So in, in this sense, uh, at least this region uh, provides us with uh, examples of both varieties of small states. So it is up to the probably historical experience and, uh, and the perceptions to, to have the answer which strategy is better. But then probably small states are uh, given some uh, big decisions to, to make when, when time comes. So in this sense, uh, how would you position then your, your research and uh, the key takeaways from your book within the broader uh, IR discussions? And what would be some directions for further research that you would recommend uh, uh, both uh, small state scholars and other interested colleagues? Well, I think I was uh, honest throughout my work that uh, it's just an attempt, first of all, of building an uh, eclectic uh, theoretical framework. So, and I'm not claiming that I was highly successful or highly convincing. That's up to the readers or, or um, of, of the book who would uh, say whether it, it offers them uh, enough grounds why my um, moving uh, in between um, major uh, theoretical uh, schools and not uh, sticking to any of them. So it's just an attempt of uh, eclectic theoretical framework, that's one. So maybe it would be uh, good to have someone else who on maybe different premises or with different variables uh, conducts uh, similar, similar research and not necessarily on the topic of uh, military non-alignment. That's one. And the second is, I was drawn by how small state scholars still fail to explain to one question that was crucial for me, and that is why and how smallness actually matters, and mm -hmm. in which areas. And 
I was not particularly convinced that uh, majority of small state scholars are not basically saying saying uh, small states are just as big states but just mm -hmm. acting small, just acting with smaller material capacities and I was not very um, convinced mm -hmm. by that argument but yet myself I, I couldn't be very straightforward, I couldn't be very resolute in pointing to yes this is where the smallness actually uh, comes into mm -hmm. the into the place. It's very easy to say military neutrality was historically a strategy uh, mostly pursued by small states and yesterday military non-alignment as we can see is a strategy that small states in their own self-perceptions pursue but still I wanted to point to very particular areas that say yes yeah, this is where being a small state uh, actually pushes you to this on that direction. I would also like to see more research on security strategies of small states in general, mm -hmm. although some, some relevant work has been done there, uh, but still not on a very conceptual level. I still see many case studies that do not necessarily speak to each other, mm -hmm. as was uh, the case in military neutrality literature. I also find Mary, uh, many rich and many well-written uh, examples of case studies uh, being done, done but actually not uh, speaking to each other. So uh, yes, I do not claim that my work is simply a warming up of uh, Cold War literature uh, or warming up of two typical case studies because it, it's not actually uh, that no one uh, did any previous research on Sweden or uh, former Yugoslavia and its membership in non-aligned movement because that research has been done before. But what I wanted to do is uh, trying to, first of all, connect uh, historical accounts of neutrality, which I was... Um, drawn to as a very interesting read, but then I did not find anything conceptually rich there, uh, and I wanted to assess the validity of that literature in today's international security agenda, which is significantly different compared to what uh, military neutral and some uh, small states uh, scholars did, and that's mostly Cold War uh, context. Uh, I I would say from my own reading of your book that you managed to to do a very complex case study analysis which was uh, very critical. It was actually very comprehensive and uh, it is, a, I think, a good, good example of how such analysis can be done for scholars of uh, both uh, area studies research and both for small states. And that book has also its... Uh, a theoretical uh, underpinning, so I think it's a, a very, very uh, good example of uh, uh, a book that uh, can be example for other, I would say, doctoral students from this faculty here and for other colleagues. So my question then goes uh, to close this uh, this uh, uh, very interesting discussion about uh, what would be your ad advice, your key piece of, the, of advice, how to approach. Uh, research and writing in English, and how to publish your book uh, with a reputable international publisher? Well, I did have that luxury of uh, doing a significant portion of my research uh, in English-speaking environments, so I did have that luxury to actually do research uh, with colleagues at Swedish Defense University, so I, I, I have started writing my project down in English from the onset, so that would be a very practical uh, uh, tip from the very beginning. If you are thinking of publishing in, in English, then start writing immediately uh, in English. As for publishing your PhD project, uh, I would say listen to the editors. Uh, uh -huh because uh, we are, once uh, we are done with our PhD projects, we are very much consumed by the project and the time we spent with it, with it. at least that was the case uh, in uh, my own case. Um, and then it's very hard to look at it with uh, the other pair of eyes and to have a critical review of it, etc., etc. 
uh, and I was uh, pretty much uh, forcing myself to uh, make a book out of it uh, immediately after it was still hot in the form of PhD thesis, which was which was and was at the same time was not a very good strategy to do because uh, I wanted to present it in the form of PhD thesis, and that's not really how uh, editors would say, and that's not how we want the book to look at. But uh, editors and then uh, reviewers that uh, look at, uh, looked at the strategy had some very useful. Uh, comments. Uh, so yes, I would say uh, listen to the editors and do not think that you are producing the same material for your supervisors or for your uh, PhD um, uh, committee because you're not. It's a different uh, readership. And that I mean, this is my humble experience. This is my first and only book so far, but that's my experience of producing. Excellent. Uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, I would like to uh, thank Elena for being our guest today in this uh, episode uh, of uh, the Security Theatre, which focused on small states uh, and uh, military neutrality. Uh, so we are particularly happy to discuss international relations and uh, books uh, such as Yelena's uh, in this uh, famous amphitheater at the Faculty of Political Science. And uh, of course, we are uh, very glad to welcome uh, the FPN alumni in this uh, particular format, which is the Security Theater. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you in the next episode. <laughs>